Hello, everybody. My name is Harold Trincunas. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. And I'd like to welcome you to our center's weekly research seminar. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. David Blum uh, from Next Tier Concepts, talking to us about sourcing artificial intelligence from industry, what is real and what isn't. Uh, Dr. Blum is um, a Principal Data Scientist at Next Tier Concepts where he supports the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the U.S. intelligence community. He also teaches at Johns Hopkins uh, University and his previous work uh, uh, on operations research and re uh, risk analysis uh, has focused on uh, topics such as IEDs, um, threat finance, counterterrorism operations, uh, and related security topics. Uh, topics. Uh, he's also a former pre-doctoral uh, fellow at CSAC, and he received his PhD in Management Science and Engineering from uh, Stanford University. Welcome, uh, David. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much, Harold, and it's good to be back. I haven't given one of these talks in eight years since uh, just before I was wrapping up my dissertation um, as a pre-doc fellow at CSAC, um, although I've sat in on uh, on plenty of seminars as a member of the audience. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, engaging with the CSAC community today. So um, to give some background, um, or actually uh, an outline of where I'm gonna be going today with this talk, I'm gonna begin with um, uh, my motivation, um, uh, what it, why it is that I'm presenting this and what I hope to contribute to the broader debate. Uh, I'll discuss the scope of the talk and in particular, the, my choice um, to use the data that I'm gonna present today, which is derived from uh, the government's primary contracting website, beta.sam.gov, um, and why in particular I'm focusing on these data rather than the, the several strategy documents that have um, been released over the last two years from the Defense Department, from the from the exec, from the office of the of the executive, um, and uh, from the from the Jake most recently um, regarding the the purpose and the goals of of uh, AI uh, in national security. Uh, I will then give a, some background on um, artificial intelligence and machine learning specifically um, in national security. Uh, with a, kind of a culmination in what are the major concerns regarding the implementation of AI uh, and how it can go awry. Uh, the substance of the talk is going to focus on five examples of um, solicitations that are active in uh, beta.sam.gov, um, which are, I've cherry picked because it, in my opinion, they cover the breadth of the, of the, uh, the field as far as what the Department of Defense is trying to um, solicit from industry um, with respect to AI. They certainly are not exhaustive, but I, I feel that they are uh, reasonably representative. Um, and finally, I will wrap up with um, some discussion of the themes from those five examples. So, uh, as far as my motivation, uh, the research community um, appears to be interested in understanding the Department of Defense's goals with respect to research and development of artificial intelligence technologies um, for, for at least two reasons and possibly a third reason. The first is to monitor uh, and ensure ethical and responsible use uh, of AI uh, which many fear uh, is a dangerous technology or could be a dangerous technology when applied to national security. Um, second would be comparative study in the context of the, the larger issues of international relations. Um, so CSAC currently has a technology, has a seminar series on strategic stability uh, and uh, AI is one of the technologies that is encompassed inside of strategic stability. Um, the other, uh, Larger themes might include safeguarding individual liberties like privacy. Uh, and uh, in, in this context, uh, it's important to understand what the United States is doing, um, the Defense Department in particular, uh, and uh, how that aligns to, um, to the rest of the world. And then the, the third reason, which I've, I hear a bit less, but I believe is out there, 
um, is the development of governance frameworks um, to promote accountability in, in government. And uh, this is applicable to much more than just artificial intelligence, but um, as a technology that's, com that's relatively recent um, and that has uh, exploded on the scene in the private sector, um, has led to several congressional hearings um, regarding how AI has been used to, um, in industry um, in ways that might uh, intrude on, on individual liberties uh, and privacy. Um, it, it, it certainly seems like uh, the, the research community would be interested in developing a, a governance framework for this. Um, the Department of Defense and its sub-elements, like the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, have in the last two years released a set of strategy documents. Um, the strategy documents state uh, a set of mission needs um, and they uh, driving requirements for incorporating artificial intelligence into Department of Defense programs. Um, and they frame questions regarding um, how to uh, hire AI uh, the right way, whatever that is. Um, they articulate uh, such needs as developing an acquisition business model um, and developing data standards. And they go so far as to offer up a set of um, AI ethical principles, which the department will abide by. Um, but it's not clear to me whether, first of all, whether the broader policy community actually trusts DOD with respect to these strategy documents. Um, do the stated mission needs actually uh, amount to um, a benefit which exceed the risk of artificial intelligence misuse? Um, is the department actually being forthright regarding the stated mission needs? And uh, even if the answer is um, yes to both of those two questions, um, will the AI be developed and managed and deployed in a responsible way? Um, uh, for example, using trade, uh, training data that are debiased and, uh, and maintained and that training is not left on autopilot, uh, which might lead um, to some version of the Terminator Skynet where the machines uh, attack their human overlords um, because uh, they've, they've grown uh, so smart through the course of automatic retraining. Um, and and, and I, I, I say that um, not to suggest that that's, that's a real possibility here, but it, it, it's certainly the, the extreme of where things could conceivably leave if, uh, if AI is developed in a completely irresponsible way. So, um, and, and finally, are the department's AI ethics or principles of uh, ethical principles, the right AI principles? Um, and what accountability is there to ensure that individual programs actually abide by the, the stated principles uh, and that they don't go off the rails? So that's, that's all uh, a statement of my motivation for why I feel that it's important to look at the individual business solicitations that the department has articulated rather than simply uh, analyzing the strategy documents um, at face value. So uh, to explain, further explain the scope of this talk, uh, I'll, I'll, I wanna state three cliches. Um, the first uh, is which came first, the chicken or the egg? It's not clear to me that the strategy documents precede the, the contracts themselves. Certainly in an idealized uh, acquisition system, the strategy documents would come first and the solicitations would follow from the strategy documents. Uh, in this case, that, that just doesn't seem to, to have happened. Um, many of the solicitations that are active within the beta.sam.gov website uh, predate the, our, the release of, of these strategy documents. And while it's possible that the strategy documents were developed in a vacuum, that just doesn't seem plausible. It seems more likely that they um, would have drawn on the solicitations uh, to inform them, not necessarily to, um, to back them up. It may be that, that uh, the authors of the strategy documents have reviewed these solicitations and have seen things that they didn't like and that they articulated uh, a strategy which, which may correct for, for deficiencies. Uh, the second cliche is follow the money. Uh, in the acquisition world, strategy documents convey where things might go in the future, um, but no one's getting paid for answering a question that was stated in the strategy document. They're getting paid for responding to a solicitation uh, and being selected as the winning bid. And then the final uh, cliche is the proof is in the pudding. 
sourcing technology from industry uh, requires a solicitation, which states what the government intends to buy and the criteria against which, which a submission will be judged. If there's no solicitation, there will be no purchase. And submissions that do not address a solicitation are non-responsive, and they may be reject rejected outright prior to ever being formally evaluated. In order to differentiate a bid, uh, industry may choose to uh, incorporate features that go beyond what has been solicited. Um, but first and foremost, any bid is going to attempt to deliver exactly what the government is asking for in its solicitation. So you might ask, uh, aren't these solicitations classified or at least really juicy ones, um, uh, the ones that, that we would care to study? And perhaps they are, but the open solicitation system does not preclude classifying individual components whose disclosure would damage national security and affording them uh, protection. It's very common to see the solicitations on data.sam.gov that uh, there is some classified component that's not being released as part of the solicitation to the website. Um, and it's, it's stated right on there. So uh, what I think it comes down to is, uh, as far as whether or not this data source is trustworthy, is whether you believe that the government's at the forefront of AI research. And if so, then it, it seems reasonable that the best uh, AI would be protected inside the black world. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, if you believe that academia and, uh, and non-national security private sector research are at the forefront of artificial intelligence research, then the only way that the government is going to get it, short of appealing to some researchers' desire to be James Bond, is through an open solicitation. Uh, the bottom line is that the data I'm going to present are not intended to be exhaustive by any stretch. A lot will be missing, both because of security, but more importantly, because of the sheer volume of, of what's in there and uh, what would require review. Um, but there's still plenty of fodder to work with. Uh, and I believe that the samples that uh, I'm going to present here um, uh, are, are representative of the big themes that you'll find within beta.sam.gov. So a little bit more about this, web, uh, about this data source. Um, if you aren't otherwise familiar with the website, it is, a, it is the, the hub for all information relating to uh, unclassified government contracts. It includes the um, pre-solicitation notices. It includes requests for information. Uh, it, includes, it includes the, the requests for proposals, which can come in the form of broad agency announcements or BAAs as well as uh, other kinds of uh, contract vehicles that um, may, not be, uh, may not fall within the scope of the federal acquisition regulations. Uh, they're commonly referred to as other transactional authorities. Um, and every contract is supposed to at least have a stub in beta.sam.gov. Uh, that stub may not be very detailed um, and it will include uh, opportunities that are primarily being managed in other forums. For example, you'll have um, consortiums that have um, been awarded a contract to manage some aspects of Department of Defense procurement for a, a, given, um, a given capability. And so the primary solicitations will go out from that consortium's website rather than through beta.sam.gov, but beta.sam.gov should still have a, a, a stub that, um, that directs you to the consortium uh, so that you can get additional details. Um, the, the most notable missing data, in my opinion, would, would be federal research grants, um, which uh, would, would be reported through other channels. They wouldn't go out through, through beta.sam. Um, the, so, so many here will be familiar with the Department of Defense's Minerva research grants. And that, to use that as an example, Minerva has um, a, a single, or it may actually be two or three um, entries in beta, in beta SAM, but they refer to the collective program. They don't refer to the individual awards. So if you want details on the individual awards, you would have to go to a different channel to, to get that. Um, that said, uh, 
while research is an important way through which the government derives uh, new capability, it's not the, the driving force behind um, acquisition of new technology. Uh, those acquisitions um, typically come through through major awards like broad agency announcements. So moving on, um, I'd like to discuss uh, artificial intelligence in general um, for a minute to, in order to highlight some points that will, um, will come up when, we, when I later discuss the themes of, of what I see in Beta Sam. When people say artificial intelligence, what they're usually talking about is supervised machine learning. Supervised machine learning can be thought of as a statistical inference in which uh, a, a model makes a prediction after first being trained on a set of past examples. Um, the classes of problem that uh, can be analyzed with supervised machine learning can include um, static or time varying problems in the time varying problem uh, and some prediction about about future data based upon uh, based upon past and present where where the time is a factor and there might be some autocorrelation um, though another distinction will be regression or classification problems in a regression problem you're predicting a continuous value such as the time till failure of some system uh, in a classification problem, you are predicting um, one or more discrete classes um, from a set of discrete classes. Uh, this classification problems might be uh, identifying some observation as friend or foe, uh, identifying some image as a mobile ICBM or a tractor trailer, um, anything where you're attempting to uh, attribute a, a discrete class to some input data. Supervised machine learning algorithms are fit and are tested using, uh, using data that has previously been collected, just as you would fit a, a linear regression. Um, data scientists will typically use the word train rather than fit to describe what it is that they're doing. Um, the historical data that are used to fit a problem um, are referred to as training data or uh, also could be referred to as labeled data. Here the label is the um, is the output of the model, or or what was actually seen as the response? Uh, in, in other in other disciplines, they're referred to as dependent variables. Uh, linear regression is one of the simplest forms of supervised machine learning, and it and it is considered a supervised ML algorithm. Once an algorithm has been trained, it can be used to generate a maximum likelihood estimate on the different set on a different set of data whose uh, label is not yet known. Um, and these are referred to as predictions or inferences. All supervised machine learning algorithms will have some error rate uh, or error measure. Um, and that error measure can be affected by many things, but it will never get to zero except in the corner case where the, um, the data themselves have been produced through some completely deterministic process. If you have that corner case, then machine learning is typically not the right technique to apply to your problem. But if you were to apply it, you, you could get a, a zero error. You could uh, eventually learn what that underlying deterministic process was that gave rise to your observations. Um, where AI is envisioned to replace or to support humans in some function, the key comparisons are first of all the relative throughputs of the process, the, exclu the, the human, entirely human process versus the machine augmented or the machine exclusive process. And the second would be the overall error rates that you would get from the machine versus the human process. And, and certainly human processes do have their error rates. Uh, in, in processes where the machine is, is um, you're offloading some very repetitive work to the machine the, the human-induced error might come from fatigue um, or uh, overload of too much information being presented at once. And in that sense, the, ma the machine will not get fatigued and the machine will not get overloaded, assuming that the underlying software has been built correctly um, and that there's sufficient compute power for it to perform its operations. For testing purposes, um, the maximum likelihood estimates would be applied uh, against a, a set of holdout data, um, which are labeled data that were held in reserve. The, the machine learning algorithm was not exposed to them when it was trained. 
uh, and so now you can um, you can confidently measure the error between what the true label was versus what the prediction was to derive your your error measurement. Supervised machine learning isn't the only kind of machine learning. Um, there are uh, there there's two other um, common classes: um, uh, unsupervised machine learning and uh, and reinforcement learning. Um, with unsupervised machine learning, you would not use training data. Instead, you would perform some sort of optimization or aggregation or other mathematical operation uh, on your production data directly. And the result of an unsupervised machine learning uh, algorithm is typically some kind of clustering of the data. For example, you, if you're looking at people, you might cluster people into communities. You might cluster snippets of, of free text into a set of topics. You, uh, or in the case of intelligence, you might cluster uh, observations into, uh, into places or entities. So you might have many sensors that have that have uh, each ha each have their own set of observations, and from those many observations from many sensors, you might derive uh, some some smaller set of places that were observed or entities that were observed. Um, for an example of unsupervised machine learning, would be if you had poor uh, that were in some sort of um, Euclidean space with an x and a y and a z axis, and you can and you want to cluster those points into exactly K clusters, where K is a number that was arbit that's arbitrary and was chosen by the analyst. And an unsupervised machine learning algorithm could um, derive a set of cluster boundaries, which minimizes the distance uh, among the points inside of each cluster. Unlike machine learning, the meaning of artificial intelligence is not agreed upon. Some people use it to mean something that's much broader than what I just described. Um, any kind of algorithmic or computer-assisted reasoning. Uh, others use artificial intelligence to mean something that's much narrower than what I just described, a very specific class of supervised machine learning algorithm uh, called a neural network, which is, uh, is effective at making predictions on unstructured data, like images uh, or audio clips or video clips or free text. The antecedents for AI research and development within the national security community go back to World War II. Um, the modern push to operationalize artificial intelligence um, to a wide swath of military problems is about five years old, goes back to somewhere around 2015, and it follows the widespread availability of computing hardware that is, uh, that is able to train neural networks, which are quite computationally expensive. The department has been using a different class of automation system, uh, system called an expert system for, for decades to automate its business processes, its logistics processes, and, uh, and even some weapons processes. And so I think it's worthwhile to, to spend a minute to distinguish between machine learning versus expert systems um, when it comes to, to, uh, to autonomy. Um, expert systems are are computer-based automations that are applied to, that apply a scripted set of actions whenever the conditions are present. In other words, they're rules, and they're rules that get applied when conditions get met. The military has used expert systems to assist in the employment of weapons uh, through, through automated launch. Uh, two examples of this would be the F-16's continuously calculated impact point and the Navy's close-in weapon system, which defends ships. Um, Arguments have been made uh, for and against expert systems in the nuclear application. In favor would be the argument that it adds predictability uh, and increased credibility to a nuclear response. Um, the predictability, the, the, the rules are the rules, and, uh, and so uh, a, a response uh, would be deterministic based upon conditions being met. Um, certainly makes it predictable, um, and, uh, and the credibility is there too. Um, if, if the, the system that is being automated through, through the expert system is, is uh, made public. Uh, the argument against would be inadvertent escalation through the coupling of expert systems on both sides, where uh, two different expert systems, um, uh, which each are responding to, to some uh, uncertain condition, 
um, in their rule sets uh, lead to, to uh, tit for tat escalation. Um, and, and this is represented in the concept of the fog of war. Key characteristics of expert systems um, are that their rules are crafted by people. Um, in the case of the Navy SeaWiz, um, the close and close and weapon system, uh, a set of people agree on parameters which would constitute a threat to a ship. Um, that those parameters would likely be informed by modeling simulation, but at the end of the day, they're parameters that people agree to. Um, and ultimately, it's it's people who authorize the SeaWiz to engage a target um, once those conditions are met. And you can think of that that. Um, uh, authorization to engage based upon a set of conditions um, as the decision to employ the weapon system. It's just that the action of employing it is deferred until those conditions are present. Um, under uh, supervised machine learning, an algorithm is penalized for its incorrect predictions uh, and it discovers the parameters. Those parameters are not selected by people. Um, eventually, a rule set um, is learned um, and that rule set produces the smallest penalty uh, based upon the training data that the algorithm was exposed to. Um, this is done through iteratively adjusting the parameters in small increments until no further adjustment yields any reduction. Uh, data scientists do not set response thresholds with, with, uh, super, with supervised machine learning. Instead, the data scientists curate a set of training data and they perform additional functions related to that um, data curation they identify the set of features in the data that the algorithm will train on, and they, um, they uh, may derive additional features um, to make an algorithm more performant or efficient. This is referred to as feature engineering. Um, an example of feature engineering might be um, deriving the velocity of some, uh, of some entity that's moving based upon um, entity positions and timestamps. So the raw data would include the positions and timestamps, the velocity uh, and, and other you know, third and fourth moments would be derived from that data. Uh, data scientists would also apply transformations to put the data in a form that the algorithm requires in order to, to train and to infer and would assemble the training data in the batch, uh, into batches for training. But at no point would the data scientist actually uh, make a decision that these are the features that matter. Um, or ex excuse me, let me let me say that a little bit more precisely. The data scientists will reduce the problem to a set of features. They do perform a first cut as far as identifying um, identifying relevant features and deriving new ones. What they wouldn't do is define a set of thresholds um, for each of those features that would trigger the response, that the, would trigger the AI's response. So it might, you, you can see how using AI could lead to automation. It, it makes automation much easier than it, would, than it might otherwise be. But the AI itself does not imply anything that's actually automated. Uh, the AI makes a prediction and uh, the next step is defined by other technologies and other policies. Uh, and it's quite common for there to be human review of an AI prediction in certain applications, um, uh, especially applications where the goal of the AI is, in, is to reduce the manual workload of a person who's otherwise performing a repetitive task. Um, in that case, the AI is monitoring a situation, uh, or an example of, an example of such a case would be AI that monitors a situation and attempts to make a detection of a rare event. Um, for example, a missile launch. So if the human is doing this manually, they have to monitor a continuous stream of data forever and ever and ever, and they might um, detect that rare event uh, every once in a while. In, in the case where the human is augmented with AI, the AI uh, monitors the situation, makes the prediction of a rare event. At that point, the human can go and review the event manually and see if, uh, if they confer or disagree. So how might AI go awry? Um, first, uh, a model might overfit to its training data. Um, models can be brittle to the examples that they were exposed to, um, and they, they may reject any example that's outside of their original training set. This is a, a core data science problem, and it's one that is an active area of research to develop new techniques that lead to model generalization. 
um, and reduce the reduce the brittleness of, of models. Uh, there, there are many techniques out there that have been developed so far to, to do this. Um, in the case of neural networks, uh, which is again one class of supervised machine learning problem, uh, one technique might be to, to randomly drop out a portion of the, of the model, uh, one of the layers in the neural network, and force the neural network to accommodate the, the missing layer. Uh, it will, over the course of many exposures to training data, learn how not to depend on any one layer in the model. Uh, that's just one of, one of many techniques. Um, another way which AI might go awry would, is that predict, its predictions can, can be very opaque. Uh, sometimes an optimal learned rule set that's discovered through AI is intuitive and explainable, but at least with neural networks, this is the exception, not the rule. And much more often the opposite is true where, where it's not clear how the neural network um, came to learn its rule set or even what the rules for making its classification decision uh, prediction actually are. Again, there are techniques that are being pursued uh, to make AI more explainable, um, to, to be able to articulate what the learned rule set is rather than have it be something that's captured in a set of, uh, in, in a very large set of parameters. And um, finally, uh, because of the potential for opacity um, in prediction, uh, it's, it's very important to, for any given AI model to undergo extensive testing prior to its acceptance to make sure that even if we, we can't explain why the AI made, a, made the prediction it made, that the behavior that the AI is producing is uh, suitable for its intended use. Um, and you, you can, in this case, you can think of the AI like a black box where we might not know what's going on inside the black box, but we know what the inputs were. We, we believe that the outputs are, uh, are a reasonable set of outputs for the inputs. And uh, if, if both of those conditions are true, then, then we set aside our curiosity and, and don't concern ourselves that, that we don't understand what, what occurred inside the black box to produce the outputs. Uh, another way which AI can go awry um, is, uh, is that it, it's been exposed to a set of biased training data. This is um, currently a focus of a lot of attention within the AI community. Uh, it's been highlighted in many private sector AI applications. Uh, we will get a statistical bias whenever the training data um, have a median value of a given feature that is um, that is not representative of the median value of the universe of data from which they're drawn. So, so what does that mean in, in real terms? Uh, you can imagine some kind of image classifier that, is, uh, that operates on images of people, and perhaps that image classifier was trained exclusively on people who are white, or, uh, or simply that the images of, um, of uh, non-white people are underrepresented, and so, so it, it the, the classifications that it applies are um, classifications that are, uh, are, are more relevant to the population that it was trained on, uh, that, that, that its training data was biased towards than the training data, than the population that it was biased against. Uh, sorry, I need to pause for a second. Um, So uh, uh, another way in which, which AI can go awry is that the training data do not evolve uh, with time um, and eventually become stale. This can be referred to as model drift if the, if the true data that the model is predicting on are evolving with time. It's easy to see an example of this with automatic translators. Where language evolves with time, it's, it's critical that the training data for the automatic translator uh, keep pace with the with the the change in the usage of words. Uh, otherwise, eventually, it's going to be making predictions that um, that are uh, reflective of some previous era. Uh, the the need to maintain model currency um, implies a need to perform continuous model retraining, and uh, in order to prevent the the aging out of the of the model. And that continuous model retraining leads to the last way 
which, uh, which AI can go awry and probably, um, probably the most important, uh, at least in, in the national security application. And that's that uh, the automatic retraining of a model can, lead, can behave in some unanticipated way. Uh, imagine that you have a model that you believe needs to be retrained continuously in order to remain current. Uh, that retraining process uh, is, uh, takes a lot of effort and is time consuming. And you have a strong incentive to automate as much of it as you can. Uh, the problem with automating the retraining process is that the, the uh, weights that have been derived at some time after the initial model deployment will likely not have been subjected to nearly as much acceptance testing as, uh, as when the model was first deployed. And uh, furthermore, the model's behavior is actually changing with time. And so it becomes critical to perform that acceptance testing in order to keep track of what the model's behavior is. It, in the extreme, if you perform no acceptance testing, then you may have a model that produces, uh, has behaviors that are completely inconsistent with what you intend and, uh, uh, and, and that are evolving and eventually, uh, 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 eventually behave in anomalous ways uh, and and again, that's the that's the Skynet scenario where where the model um, the model produces results that were never intended uh, by the by the model designers. So uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, move on to the beta SAM source that I've talked about um, uh, that I've alluded to so far. Okay. Um, this is what you see when you first go to beta.sam.gov. Um, as you can see, uh, it presents you with a nice search bar to search contracting opportunities. Uh, and so when I, uh, when I type, quote, artificial intelligence, end quote, into the search bar, I get back 775 uh, active results. If I look for inactive results, then it numbers uh, in the, in the uh, 10,000 plus range. Uh, active doesn't mean currently open. Uh, a result can be active even if solicitations are no longer being accepted. Typically, something that's inactive will either have been canceled um, or uh, it was, it was um, removed from the Betasam system because it's no longer being performed. The, 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 uh, the contract was, was performed, the capability was delivered, and now it's been closed out. So 775 currently active um, uh, AI opportunities. Uh, if, if I remove um, sole source awards, which typically have very little descriptive information attached to them, then it goes down to 668. Uh, it, it, this number of awards probably merits some large end analysis of the corpus. Um, the problem with that is that the relevant details are buried in pretext and oftentimes in PDF and PowerPoint documents that are actually attached to the, to the stubs, not in the stubs themselves. Uh, so so it, it, it's quite an undertaking to encode this data um, to perform that large of analysis. And I'm not clear that it would yield insight that, um, that are that, uh, that interesting. I think instead, the, the, the close analysis of some select examples is, uh, is more, more relevant and more interesting. And I'm gonna discuss five samples in particular. So next slide, please. I'm gonna start with um, the Army Research Lab opportunity uh, on behalf of the algorithmic cro warfare cross-functional team called Project Maven. Reason I'm starting here is that Project Maven has been in the news quite a bit. Uh, and I, I believe that it's at least what popularized these questions of, uh, of what's the Department of Defense doing with artificial intelligence. Um, according to reports from, uh, from Gizmodo uh, and other uh, media outlets, uh, up to 3,000 uh, Googlers who were working on the Project Maven or who were concerned about their company's work on the Project Maven uh, voiced some sort of discontent with some subset of that of them actually quitting their jobs. Uh, and that ultimately led to Google withdrawing from its project, from its, from its contract on, on Project Maven. So, so I think that this is the kind of the, the granddaddy of the opportunities that led to, to 
this concern about the weaponization of artificial intelligence uh, uh, in the Department of Defense. Uh, it's dated, uh, it's from October 2017, um, but it's a, I think it's a good place to start. So uh, I've, I've uh, copied in what I believe are the relevant language from, uh, from the website. Uh, you, can, you can read it. Um, I am going to focus uh, on the terms that I highlighted, which is to support processing, exploitation, and dissemination, or, uh, or abbreviated PED. Um, let's see. So my take is that um, PED is the core function of, of intelligence. It's uh, often a laborious function. And the usage of the terms to support PED, um, to me, uh, conveys that the purpose of the AI is to reduce the burden on the humans and to enable what's otherwise uh, a, a human-based uh, process. Uh, it, it will, um, I don't see anything in this that would imply um, automation of intelligence production without human review. Uh, it, it may be that that's there. Again, this is my interpretation of the language uh, in the opportunity, but anybody who was responding to this opportunity would have seen this and would have understood that this is what the department's requesting, and this is what I'm going to propose. Uh, hopefully, my bid will get selected if I make a compelling case for, for why my technology will be successful. And finally, the output of the of the, the AI would be anything that um, existing uh, PED processes could output. Um, that might mean um, it, it, it might be uh, situational awareness to monitor an area for IED explosions. Uh, it might be to support an ongoing military operation through through Overwatch. Uh, it it might it might include um, the concerns that the, the Googlers apparently uh, articulated regarding the, the data being used for targeting. But the, the key point is that um, these processes exist today. They're human-based processes. The department is uh, soliciting um, technologies to, to uh, support the humans um, uh, and, allow, and, and, and reduce the, the labor burden. And then the questions will go back to the two that I presented earlier. Does it lead to an increase in throughput? And does it lead to a reduction in the overall, uh, the overall air rate between uh, what the humans do uh, in, the, uh, in their, their existing um, laborious processes versus what they do when they're augmented with AI? Next slide, please. So I'm going to fast forward uh, ahead to an opportunity that was posted just last week. Um, the Army Futures Command posted an opportunity for the operationally manned fighting vehicle and uh, an RFI for how artificial intelligence might be used in support of that. Uh, if you haven't heard of the operationally manned fighting vehicle before, it is, uh, it is supposed to be the replacement for the Army's uh, M2 Bradley fighting vehicle. The relevant language uh, in, in this opportunity that I've highlighted um, is to continuously improve the platform performance. So my take on this is that uh, it implies that the AI is gonna be used um, for the maintenance of the weapon system, um, uh, predictive health maintenance, um, and to, to continuously uh, improve the performance of the weapon system in, in some aspect. So that um, the, in continuously improved performance is not defined um, and, and we need to read into uh, what that might mean. But other language here in the, in the opportunity stresses uh, modular open system approach. So what I get from that is that the department is interested in using commercial off-the-shelf off technologies to enable an upgrade path and, and improve performance as a reference to the upgrade path um, so that they're not locked into a proprietary framework um, for any future upgrades. Uh, as far as pr predictive health maintenance goes, this is a classic vehicle design challenge in the private sector. 
um, and the usage of AI uh, is in line with current commercial practices. Um, and that the fact that the, that the vehicle is a weapon system is, is incidental. Um, as far as continuously improving performance, um, again, uh, I, I take that in the context of the, of the, modular, um, the modular system that they're asking for, uh, I look at that as really a, a reference to, we don't know what performance improvements we're gonna want in the future, but we know that we want this vehicle to be upgraded so give us, uh, give us an easy way to do that, one that utilizes this modular open spec system. So um, the third example uh, is a, um, an Air Force Research Lab opportunity. Um, and here, the Air Force Research Lab is looking for AI to learn how humans respond to a complex situation. And in particular, they want to utilize video games um, to, uh, to, to learn how humans uh, what humans key in on. It's, it's, it's effectively a, a, a pattern recognition problem um, and they want to transfer how the humans learn to see patterns to the machine in the hopes that they can use this to uh, improve their, their battle management mission. Uh, next slide. So the, this Air Force opportunity, which is called Vault, um, it represents what, what I take to be general AI services. And, and I included this because this is actually what's predominantly in BetaSAM more than anything else are these, these, these general AI services. And it's hard to know what to make of them. Um, on one hand, so, so AI is, is beyond the algorithms, there's a lot of complexity that goes into actually implementing the AI in software. And, and I interpret this as saying uh, some, some data science equivalent to we want a contract plumber who's on call whenever we need them to make sure that things run. Uh, it, it's, it's something that the department would, would need to have in order to make sure that their AI actually works um, because systems are going to break and, and at that point they need to call their plumber. And then my last slide uh, uh, rep is, is for the Army's um, Advanced Targeting and Lethality Automated System. So this is the, the weaponized AI um, that I think many fear, uh, fear exists. Um, and, uh, and it is real, it is here. The Army has, uh, if, if, you, if you look at the highlighted language, they're looking to automate target acquisition, um, automate fire control. Um, and do so with the purpose of enabling the operator to engage targets substantially faster. This is uh, as close as I found in beta SAM to using artificial intelligence to automate a kill chain. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't claim to, to automate the weapons employment decision, but clearly that's a policy decision, not a technology. Um, the technology, if you can automate target acquisition, you can automate weapons employment. And so the question of whether or not you do so is, is, a, is a question of policy. Um, like the weapons themselves, this is inherently dangerous. Uh, and uh, so I believe that, that more than any other opportunity, this illustrates the need for great care to be taken in the training and continuous retraining of models to ensure that behaviors are, um, are intended and are suitable to the application. So um, I didn't have time to discuss what I believe are the overarching themes of, uh, of these opportunities. Um, the point that I want to make is, is that weaponized AI appears to be a very small minority uh, of, of opportunities here, but it is there. Um, generalized AI services uh, are quite prevalent throughout BetaSAM. Um, and I think it illustrates the problem, the practical problem of implementing AI beyond algorithm design, the, the problem of making sure that, that the systems actually work, um, that, that the computer systems are built and that are, are, are maintained to execute the algorithms. Um, and then uh, beyond those two, uh, opportunities appear to be um, clustered around those areas that I highlighted, the learning how humans behave, um, automating rep repetitive tasks, um, such as we find with intelligence exploitation, um, and uh, enhancing, uh, enhancing vehicle performance and, and performing predictive health maintenance. 
Um, so I'll wrap up there and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you very much, David. Um, we have a, a few questions, and uh, as I said, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom um, uh, application, and uh, we'll take uh, some questions from our CSAC fellows first, and then go to the more general questions. Um, so I have a question from uh, Gil Barham um, for you. Uh, she asks, have you come across any other interesting work or approaches to using the beta.sam.gov beta data to analyze the military's adoption of other innovations? This is a category of a, a larger body of research. Yeah, no, great question. So um, I, I haven't, uh, and I think that it's a, a great public resource, public data, data set that I would like to see uh, exploited for, for other uses. Um, there, there certainly are, are uh, other technologies that appear um, throughout Beta Sam. Uh, I keyed in on AI, but, but there's no reason to stop there. Thanks, thanks, David. The next question is from John Emery, one of our postdoctoral fellows, um, who actually, I think you'd find his work uh, particularly interesting. He has a new article out um, that you should check out. Um, to what extent is the human in the loop ethical principle of the DOD missing uh, the element of the framing effect AI has on decision makers uh, with via the automation bias. AI rests on an assumption that a machine driven system is going to offer better results than human judgment. So to what extent might machine learning just justify existing practices um, uh, in the military and not actually improve outcomes such as with, let's say, reducing civilian casualties? Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful observation. So uh, I agree with your point that um, w when AI models are built, the problem is effectively framed one time and, uh, and features are selected to address that specific problem. And, um, and at that point, the machine, uh, the, the machine runs uh, perhaps on autopilot, perhaps with, with um, monitoring, but it's never going to change the answer. It, 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 the, 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 problem against which it's developing answers for. So it relies on um, that, on that framing um, being uh, an accurate, the, the problem definition of the AI being an accurate representation of a decision maker's problem. And decision makers don't ask questions in a vacuum. They ask a question, they, they get an answer, and that typically leads to a bunch of new questions. And the AI is not going to offer insight into those new questions. So Although I, I, I disagree a bit with the, your, your premise that, that the AI's sole purpose is to perform decision support, but it's clearly one of the purposes. Um, to the extent that the AI is, is uh, reducing the labor of a repetitive task, that's, uh, it's, it's easier to, to understand why you would want to have, uh, it, why it would be appropriate to have that, that one-time framing. For decision support though, um, if you rely on AI for your decision support, you are in a bed of hot water. Thanks. Um, so a question from Anurag Upadhyay. Um, he talks about whether there's such a concept of algorithm war. He's talking about the interaction between, let's say, US AI and Chinese AI, or in his, um, he's asking a question about India and China. Uh, so to what extent is uh, uh, this even an issue, or is this just some sort of term that's just tossed around uh, by people who don't really understand what's what's uh, going on. So maybe something on relative capabilities. Yeah, so this might be my ignorance, but the only governmental use, the only US government use of the term algorithm war that I've heard is with the algorithmic warfare cross-functional team, which um, evolved into the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. That was the, the name of the team when it was originally conceived. Um, I do know that algorithm war is used within the popular press more. Um, I haven't seen that, um, that term used in the government beyond that initial team that was stood up for Project Maven. Uh, and I, but, but the, the root of your question, the, the, the interaction of, of AI, the coupling of AI, I think is really interesting. Um, I, I suspect that, um, the interaction of agents is one of the things that would likely be studied um, in that Air Force Research Lab um, uh, broad agency announcement that I, I presented as one of the examples. Um, it, 
it's not something that I see very prevalent in Beta Sam. Um, I, I, uh, I did see one other example that I didn't present that was coming out of the Navy that seemed to allude to that sort of thing. But in both cases, they were more interested in learning from the people rather than managing the algorithms. So I think the managing of the algorithm is kind of a, a meta problem. Okay, uh, thanks, David. I think um, time for one more question. Um, and I wonder to what extent um, what you're seeing in beta.sam.gov uh, is an indication of how the issue of trusting uh, AI or ma machine learning uh, decision support has evolved? Because I know this is a concern early on that people might not trust you know, the, the, the suggestions or uh, decisions being made by AI. Are you seeing like a trend that the trend which you're seeing in beta.sam.gov shows that this is being overcome or do you think this is still a persistent issue? I, I'm actually, this is a question that's near and dear to my heart. Um, as an operations research scientist um, who, who evolved into a data scientist, uh, a lot of the issues that I encountered in supporting the DOD leadership early in my career related to trust of the models, trust of the simulations. Um, the sense that I get is that the, the repetitive tasks and are, are, are um, understood to be something where you, you require a machine, whether it's an expert system or whether it's an AI, to do some of it because there's simply too much work for the human to do. And in many cases, um, it's not work that humans wanna do. Uh, if I'm trying to optimize the, end, the timing of my, of my engine um, in order to get the, the most horsepower, the most torque, um, I, I want an AI doing that optimization or, or, some, or some expert system performing the optimization. I, I don't want a human to be, to be crunching those numbers over and over again. Um, the, I think the department is comfortable with using AI to automate the, the low level detection of information and data that gets surfaced to the human and the human to perform a review of the, of the AI's predictions. Um, for purposes of intelligence exploitation or other, other kinds of, um, of labor reduction. Um, I don't, I, I, even though I have seen quite a few examples of AI for decision support, I haven't seen anything that shows that it's farther than research. I, I haven't heard of, um, of major decisions being made based upon um, the output of, of AI saying, okay, well, the AI predicted that, that um, there's going to be this IED attack over there. So we're going to, you know, move, uh, evacuate the area and do take a bunch of other extensive actions because it was what the AI said. Um, I'm really interested to see that because I, I suspect at some point there will be more trust placed in AI to perform those kinds of um, decision support um, functions. Thanks. Um... Well, I, we're just out of time. So uh, everyone, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. David Blum from uh, Next Year Concepts for his talk on uh, what's real and what's not in AI uh, uh, acquisitions uh, today. Thank you, David. Thank you, Harold. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody.